Hello and welcome to PMP certification course offered by Simply Learn. In this lesson, we will be introduced to the PMP certification course. All our five practice tests are aligned with the new exam format rolled out by PMI version 5, 2013. After completing this lesson, you will be able to define PMI and PMP, identify the application requirements for the PMP examination, Identify the guidelines to fill up the PMP application. Describe the PMP exam outline and syllabus. Let us now begin with the terms PMI and PMP. Project Management Institute, or PMI, is not-for-profit organization that offers a certification program for project practitioners for all educational and skill levels. PMI is based in the USA and has local chapters across the globe. Therefore, if you are based in Singapore, you can look for a PMI chapter in Singapore. Such local chapters conduct regular knowledge sharing and networking sessions for people interested in project management. Project Management Professional, or PMP on the other hand, is one of the certifications awarded by PMI. It is a credential industry recognized and demanded worldwide. For many of the project management jobs, it is a mandatory qualification. PMP is not restricted to a specific domain. A project manager working in any industry, be it manufacturing, retail, defense, or information technology, can write the PMP exam and, upon successful completion, can be a PMP certified professional. To sum up, PMI is an organization and PMP is a credential. PMI therefore writes and supervises the PMP examinations. If you need more information on PMI, you can visit their website, www.pmi.org. A PMP credential is valid for three years. After the completion of this three-year period, it can be renewed for another three years. PMI measures project management experience in the units of PDU. PDU means Professional Development Unit. You can acquire PDUs in many ways. For example, if you attend a project management class of one hour by an expert, it is considered equivalent to one PDU. If you write a white paper on the topic related to project management, it may be equivalent to five PDUs. PMI has detailed guidelines on what kind of project management activity amounts to how many PDUs. You can look for the CCR Handbook on the PMI website for more details. Over a three-year period, one must have acquired 60 PDUs to be eligible to renew the PMP certification. After submitting the information about the acquisition of at least 60 PDUs in the last three-year period, you need to pay the renewal fee in order to renew the certification for another three years. This can be conveniently done online at www.pmi.org. PMI releases a guide every four years. It's called PMBOK Guide, that is, a guide to the project management body of knowledge. PMBOK Guide acts as a textbook for the PMP exam. PMBOK Guide can be considered as a standard for project management profession. In the next screen, we will look into the application requirements for the PMP exam. PMI-PMP certificate is an experience as well as knowledge-based certification. This means certain prerequisites are to be met in order to be able to apply for this certification. The prerequisites depend upon a person's formal education. As shown in the table, a professional needs to have at least 4,500 hours of project management experience along with a bachelor's degree. A professional whose highest formal education is high school degree will require 7,500 hours of project management experience. The experience of 36 months within last eight years in the table implies that those 4,500 hours of project management experience should have happened within the last eight years prior to the application. Similarly, for the experience of 60 months within last eight years, 7,500 hours of leading and directing project tasks should have happened within the last eight years. Lastly, one also has to submit details of having attended 35 hours of project management training just before writing the PMP exam. REP stands for Registered Education Provider. PMI REP Training Institute means these training companies are registered with PMI as a registered education provider. 
These provide 35 PMI contact hours certificate if you attend their 35 hour training program. Their certificate can be used as a proof to be submitted to PMI. Applications can be submitted online. Once the exam fee is paid, PMI sends an authorization letter. Many companies are PMI REP and provide project management training. Simply Learn is one of them. PMI randomly audits some applications from time to time. In the event of the application being selected for audit, clear instructions will be given on the evidence that has to be physically submitted to PMI. Follow the instructions and send the evidence before authorization is given to proceed. Examination must be written within a year of receiving the authorization letter. For more details, refer to the PMP Handbook on PMI website. Following are a few guidelines that will help you fill up your application. First, you should become a PMI member before applying for the PMP examination. If you are not already a member, members get a discount of $150 for the PMP application which is more than the cost of membership itself. This will help you save money in the first process itself. Becoming a member is a fairly straightforward process and can be completed online at www.pmi.org. Make sure you enter the contact details and name correctly. This is important for you not to miss any correspondence information. Also, ensure that the details on the certification are correct. You need to be careful while filling the Project Experience field in the Experience Verification form. Be brief in stating what you have done on the project. Focus on specifically the work that you have done. Contact all the primary contacts mentioned in your application prior to submitting it, for they should be prepared to support you in providing evidence about the experience, if required during the audit process. If you are not sure, ask an existing PMP professional to review before submitting. If your application is picked up for audit, follow the instructions given in the email. Gather the evidence and submit it for a smooth process. Now that you have a fair understanding on the filling process of PMP application, let us focus on PMP exam process in the next screen. PMP exam is conducted for four hours. It covers 200 questions, out of which 25 questions are considered as pre-test questions used for future tests and are not scored. You will not be communicated about these questions. They might be any random pick. Therefore, you should answer all 200 questions with the same seriousness. PMI includes these questions to see how many test takers are getting them right. Based on this, they might decide to include these questions in the future exam. It is similar to a survey conducted by PMI. Of the 200 questions, therefore, 175 will be scored. All questions are multiple choice questions with only one correct answer. You get one point for every question answered correctly. There is no negative marking for the incorrect ones. You may also mark a question for review and revisit it at the end if unsure then. However, you should attempt all the 200 questions in the given time. PMI grades students on each of the five process groups and based on the grading, they declare PMP pass or fail. The grades are not disclosed to everyone, rather a rating is given. They are below proficient, proficient, and moderately proficient in each of the five process groups. The percentage of questions from each of these aspects is listed on the table. The result, pass or fail, is determined by a combination of these grades. How many grades or number of points one has to score to pass the PMP exam is not made public by PMI. The questions in PMP exam are related to various aspects of project management. These aspects are project initiation, planning, executing, monitoring and controlling, and closing. We call these aspects as process groups. For more details, please refer to the PMP examination content outline on the PMI website. Let us next discuss the PMP exam syllabus. There are five process groups, 10 knowledge areas, and 47 project management processes. To understand the syllabus, you need to understand the following terms, process groups, knowledge areas, and processes. Let us first discuss process group. The project management discipline is divided into five broad process groups. When a new project starts, it is first in the project initiation phase, 
moving to planning phase, then to execution, followed by monitoring and controlling, and finally, it is closed. Project execution and monitoring and controlling processes go hand in hand. Therefore, when a new project is initiated, all processes of Project Initiation Process Group should be applied to the project. Similarly, when the project is being closed, all processes of Project Closing Group should be applied. For instance, Identify Risks is a process of Project Planning Group. So when the project is in planning phase, you must identify all the risks of the project. Next, let's see what Knowledge Area is. As per PMBOK guide, there are 10 knowledge areas. A knowledge area is a set of specific processes performed to meet a project objective. Let us now consider processes. There are 47 processes. These processes might be accomplished in the project planning process group and few others in project monitoring and controlling process group. For example, develop schedule. One of the processes is a part of the planning process group and the project time management knowledge area. Likewise, in human resource management knowledge area, develop human resource plan process is in the project planning group and manage project team process is in project execution group. Let us take an overview of all the lessons of this tutorial. We have 15 lessons in total. This is the first lesson, which is an introduction to the PMP certification. Lesson 2, Project Management Framework, aims to explain what project and project management is all about. It can be considered as an introduction to the project management. Lesson 3, that is, Project Management Processes Groups, aims to explain the five project management process groups. The 10 knowledge areas are covered in Lesson 4 to 13. Each lesson is dedicated to each of these 10 areas. Lesson 14 revises the same processes from a process group perspective. This will help clarify the sequence in which some of the activities are carried out and understand these processes more holistically. In addition to the five process groups and 10 knowledge areas, PMI gives weightage to professional and social responsibility, which has lessons of its own. Once you are through with these 15 lessons, you can go ahead and take our online practice tests. Hello, and welcome to PMP certification course offered by Simply Learn. In this lesson, we will focus on project management framework. Let us begin with the objectives of this lesson. After completing this lesson, you will be able to define project, project management, program management, and portfolio management. Recognize the roles of Project Management Office. Identify the project constraints and their impact on the project. Explain the role of a project manager in stakeholder management. Describe different organization structure. Differentiate between a project life cycle and a product life cycle. Let us begin this lesson with understanding what a project is in the next screen. A project is a temporary endeavor undertaken to create a unique product, service, or result. For example, developing a new product, service, or result, constructing a building, industrial plant, or infrastructure, and implementing, improving, or enhancing existing business processes and procedures. In the next screen, we will focus on the characteristics of a project. A project can be distinguished based on its characteristics. The definition describes two characteristics of a project. First, it is temporary in nature. Temporary here does not mean short in duration. A project can extend for long duration based on the requirements. For example, creating a new indigenous missile defense system for a country. However, there is always a definite planned start and end date for a project. It cannot go on indefinitely. Secondly, the project is supposed to produce a unique output. The output could be a product, service, or result. There can be many common activities between two projects, but the outcome of each project should be unique in some way or the other. Now, let us look at what marks the end of a project. A project ends when either the objectives are met or the project is terminated because the objectives will not or cannot be met.
The other reason to terminate the project can be that the need for the output of the project does not exist anymore. Usually, the sponsor of the project takes a call about the closure of the project. It is important to differentiate project work from regular operational work. For example, your office receptionist does the same work every day of picking any incoming call and directing the call to the right person in the office. This is an ongoing repetitive work and can be classified as operation. Operations, unlike projects, are neither temporary nor unique. Creating a new software system to effectively track your customer complaint can be an example of a project. When the software is successfully developed, the project objective is met, which marks the end of the project. When you start using this software to track customer complaints, you are entering into the operations phase. In the next screen, let us now look into project management. As defined in the PMBOK guide, Project management is the application of knowledge, skills, and tools and techniques applied to project activities to meet the project requirements. Project management is achieved by proper application and integration of the 47 processes. Project application and integration means these processes should be executed in the right manner as well as in the right order. In the next screen, let us discuss how to manage a project. Program management is defined as the application of knowledge, skills, tools, and techniques to a program to meet the program requirements and to obtain benefits and control not available by managing projects individually. As defined in PMBOK guide, a program is a group of related projects which, when managed as a group in a coordinated fashion, provides benefits and control that are not available while managing them individually. These benefits could be from decreased risk, economies of scale, improved management of dependencies, delivery of additional capabilities, optimal utilization of shared resources, and so on. Let us now learn the various features of program management. Random projects cannot be grouped together as a program. The projects in a program should be related in some way or the other, and there should be some value added in managing them together. A project may not be a part of any program, but a program will always have projects. A project can also be executed as a standalone project. A program is designed to deliver some strategic benefits value to the organization. These benefits can be tangible or intangible. Examples of tangible benefit could be increased profit margins or operational cost savings. Examples of intangible benefits could be improved team morale or building up certain competencies. While a project manager focuses relentlessly on the fulfillment of the project's requirements, that is, scope, cost, time, quality, a program manager needs to focus on ensuring that the organizational benefits are realized. In the next screen, let us understand what a portfolio is. Portfolio is yet another term used along with project and program. A portfolio may have multiple projects and programs that are managed as a group to achieve strategic objectives. Note that all projects and programs in a portfolio may not be necessarily interdependent or directly related. A portfolio can be created based on the business objectives. For example, an IT service company can have a portfolio named Japanese projects, which is formed with an aim to take over the Japanese market by giving more attention to these projects. Within this portfolio, similar projects can be managed as a program, and all banking projects from Japan can be managed as a banking program. In the next screen, let us discuss portfolio management. Portfolio management is the centralized management of one or more portfolios. This includes identifying, prioritizing, authorizing, managing, and controlling projects, programs, and other related work to achieve strategic business objectives. Therefore, whether the company should have Japanese projects as portfolio or not is decided by portfolio management. In the next screen, 
let us understand the relationship between portfolios, programs, and projects. The image on the screen will help you to understand the terms portfolios, programs, and projects. A portfolio is part of an organization's overall strategy. It represents a conscious decision by an organization to invest in the portfolio. The overall objectives of a portfolio are then cascaded down to the lower level components. The components could be sub-portfolios, programs, or projects. These components can further be broken down into smaller components for ease of management. Although a project may not contain operations, a program, or a portfolio, it can include other work. This other work may comprise training and development, customer support and services, etc. If the other work has synergy with the overall objectives and adds to the capability to deliver the higher level benefits, then it can be included in the program or portfolio as well. In the next screen, we will discuss Project Management Office. Project Management Office, or PMO, is a specific type of body or department within an organization. PMO performs several roles in the organization, and these can broadly be classified as primary roles and other roles. Typically, the PMO may take up any one or a combination of the three primary roles. It provides the policies, methodologies, and tools and templates for managing projects within the organization. It provides support and training in organization on how to manage projects. And finally, it provides project managers for different ongoing projects in the organization. PMO may also help in managing interdependencies between the projects, selecting, managing, and deploying shared or dedicated project resources, if need be, terminating a project, and organizing lessons learned sessions and maintaining the project management knowledge base for an organization. In the next screen, we will discuss how to manage the triple constraints. Any project can be done successfully if there is no constraint on time or there is unlimited budget available. Unfortunately, that is not true in real life. A project is performed within some constraint, and these constraints are usually competing. Therefore, if you change one, it would affect the other. For example, if the project duration increases, it would lead to increase in the project cost as well. Triple constraint is a term that originally referred to the three competing project constraints within which the projects are performed. These constraints are cost, time, and scope. Quality is a primary concern for a project manager. Therefore, the project manager has to make trade-offs to keep the scope, cost, time, quality plane in balance. To achieve the balance, the project manager also needs to manage other aspects of the project. For instance, the people, stakeholders, risks, communication, and procurements. The project manager plays the essential role of integrating all these different aspects of project management. In the PMP examination, you can expect business scenario-based questions focusing on the triple constraints. In the next screen, let us understand who a stakeholder is. A stakeholder can be defined as the one whose interests may positively or negatively be affected or perceived to be affected by the decision, activity, or outcome of the project. As per the definition, the project team, project manager, project sponsor, PMO office, customer, etc. are the stakeholders of the project. A project sponsor is the one who gives a go-ahead for a project and provides the necessary resources to execute the project. Therefore, the head of projects in the organization who provides a green signal to start a project and allocates required resources to the project is the project sponsor. A project sponsor is usually somebody placed high up in the organizational hierarchy of the performing organization, that is, the organization in which the work of the project is being carried out. In the next screen, let us look at stakeholder management. One of the key responsibilities of a project manager is to manage stakeholders. 
A project manager has to involve the stakeholders from the beginning of the project until the end, so they are aware of every step. A project manager has to take up specific activities for stakeholder management. Identifying both internal and external stakeholders. Missing out any stakeholder can be disastrous for a project. A stakeholder who is identified towards the end of the project may come up with his own requirement at that stage and incorporating them can be risky. Determining stakeholder requirements. After identifying all the stakeholders, the project manager also needs to ensure that their requirements are clearly identified. Sometimes, stakeholders might themselves not know of their requirement and it is the job of the project manager to get them right by doing a proper stakeholder requirement analysis. Determining stakeholder expectations. Stakeholders might also have some unstated expectations, which need to be clarified to see if it can become a project requirement. It is again the role of the project manager to determine the stakeholder's expectation. Communicating with stakeholders. Once all the stated and unstated stakeholder requirements are known, the project manager as part of stakeholder analysis should focus on communicating them regularly to keep stakeholders involved in the project. Once you understand the practices of stakeholder management, it will be easier for you to answer scenario-based questions in the examination. In the next screen, let us look at the various organization structures. Projects are performed in an organization and the functioning of the organization might affect the project. The different organization structure types explained here are based on the level of authority that a project manager gets into in those organizations. In a functional type of organization, the organization is grouped by the area of specialization within different functional areas. For instance, marketing, accounting, engineering, etc are departments within the organization. Each employee typically reports to a functional manager. In such types of organization, normally projects are undertaken within the department itself. If a project requires any assistance from another department, the request moves from the head of the requesting department to the head of the concerned department. The team members do their normal departmental work in addition to the project work. The next type of organization is projectized organization. In such organizations, there are no departments. The organization's resources mostly work on projects. Team members report to a project manager. The project manager has complete control over the resources. When the project is completed, either they move on to another project or they look for some job outside the company. They do not have a department for themselves. The third type of organization is a matrix organization, which is a blend of functional and projectized organizational structure. A team member belongs to a department as well as they are part of a project team. In such organization, team members have two bosses, one, their department head, and the second, their project manager. Since there are two bosses here, this type of organization is further classified into three different types. They are weak, strong, and balanced matrix organization. So out of the two bosses that team members have in matrix organization, if the project manager has more authority over the team member, such organizations are called strong matrix. Where the functional manager has more authority, it's a weak matrix organization. If they both share equal authority, then it is a balanced organization. There is another term that you might find in the exam called tight matrix. This generally refers to a co-located team, that is, a team that has been placed in the same location to enhance their performance. In the PMP exam, if there is no mention of the organization type, you can assume it to be a matrix organization. Let us look at each of these organization structures in detail. In the next screen, let us look at functional organization. In a functional organization, the resources of the organization are grouped by functions, sometimes called departments. Examples of functions could be sales, finance, administration, manufacturing, etc. 
Each function plays a definite role in the organization and is headed by a functional head or supervisor. All the resources in such an organization report directly into their functions. Therefore, a salesperson would report into the sales organizational hierarchy, a purchase executive would report into procurement, and so on. You would notice that in a functional organization, the project manager's role is not explicitly called out. When a functional organization embarks on a project, each of the functions that are involved may volunteer some resources to work on the project. One of these resources may end up playing the project manager's role. The resource assignments may not even be full-time, and sometimes even the project manager is part-time. Since the project manager has no authority over any of the resources, they are dependent on the functional heads. This makes it more challenging for the project manager to coordinate in the team. However, functional organizations provide an opportunity for specialization. For example, if a purchase executive was reporting into the purchase department, that executive would have exposure to all the purchasing that happens within the organization and has a well-defined career path. In functional organizations, project management happens at the functional head level. Next, let us look at the projectized organization in the next screen. The projectized organization has all the resources aligned around projects. The project managers have complete control over the resources working on their projects. The biggest advantage of the projectized organization is that the resources have loyalty to their projects and project execution becomes easier. This kind of structure is suitable for organizations whose work is in the nature of projects. There are few disadvantages in this structure as well. Firstly, the role of the resource is over once the project is completed. Secondly, highly specialized roles within a project may not be fully occupied all the time. For example, a purchase executive may have work for selected periods on a project while purchase activities are going on. However, for the rest of the period, their capability may not be optimally utilized. There is less scope for functional specialization as the project boundaries limit the kind of work for the resources. Each project manager is in charge of a project and its resources. Next, let us look at the matrix organization. In a matrix organization, the resources report to the functional managers and are managed by the project managers as well. There might even be a function that represents all the project managers in the organization, which provides project management expertise. The matrix structure has three variants, commonly referred to as weak, balanced, and strong. In a weak matrix, the authority of the project manager is the weakest and strongest in a strong matrix structure. The titles given to project managers in functional or weak matrix organizations are project expediter or project coordinator. They would be called project managers in a balanced or strong matrix structure and have slightly more authority over the time of the team members. The advantage of the matrix structure is that resources can be optimally utilized while preserving the capacity of the project managers to get projects executed efficiently. Resources can specialize in their functions and have stability in their careers also contribute to the projects at the same time potentially. The disadvantage of matrix organization is that the communication overhead increases significantly. This is because every resource in the organization belongs into a project and into a function, leading to a dual reporting structure. In a matrix organization, project management happens at project resource level. In the next screen, let us summarize the advantages and disadvantages of different organizational structures. Each organization structure has its own set of advantages and disadvantages. The advantage of functional organizations is that resources may find clearly defined career paths and achieve specialization and skill development in their respective fields. It will be a flexible workforce since only one manager will be responsible, avoiding confusion. 
The disadvantage of such organization type is that project work is hampered. Department work is always given higher priority than the project work. In addition, there is no career path in project management, which leads to lower interest in projects. In the case of the projectized organization, one of the clear advantages is better communication within the projects. Since project work is the only work team members are doing, it also leads to loyalty towards the project goals. The disadvantage of such organization type is the inefficient use of resources because every project team has their own support function. Therefore, this might lead to the duplication of effort. It also leads to the resources being left with no work since their roles are over once the project is completed. It also hampers skill development because the project requirements dictate what kind of work team members perform at different stages on a project. Now, let us look at the matrix organization. It also has the advantage of better coordination and maximum utilization of resources. However, the disadvantage is the higher potential for conflict among the managers, which might lead to communication complexity and overhead management. In the next screen, let us focus on the comparison on project life cycle and product life cycle. Project life cycle spans the initiation of a project until the closure of the project. The product life cycle, on the other hand, also encompasses the operational and maintenance phases. A typical product life cycle starts with conception of the product and goes until its withdrawal from the market. The withdrawal might be because it becomes obsolete or there is no further need for the product in the market. A product has a long life cycle. A product can require or spawn many projects over its life. For example, a project and product conception phase could be to determine customer needs, whereas a project during product maturity phase could be used to perform competitive analysis. Typically, a product life cycle is longer than the project life cycle. A project also has its own life cycle, and this life cycle depends upon the industry and the organization within which the project is being executed. Sometimes, different organizations within the same industry use different life cycles. In the next screen, let us discuss more on project life cycle. A life cycle is composed of phases. Each phase represents a discrete unit of work required to be done on the project. There are different ways of classifying project life cycles. Let us first discuss the sequential versus overlapping life cycle. In sequential phases, the subsequent phase starts only after the previous phase has been completed, whereas in overlapping phases, two or more phases may run in parallel for some time. This could help fast tracking and compressing the amount of time required. The other way of classifying life cycles is how they go about the process of planning. In predictive life cycles, there is a large upfront planning phase where all the details of scope, cost, time are planned before beginning the subsequent phases. These phases then are executed in either sequential or overlapping modes. They are suitable for large projects where all the requirements are likely to be known in advance and where upfront planning effort is required to get the necessary approvals. Another feature of predictive life cycles is that each phase may potentially be different in the nature of activities and may require people with different skill sets. For example, traditional software development life cycle has phases like requirements, feasibility, planning, design, construction, testing, and transition. We will continue project life cycles in the next screen. Incremental and iterative life cycles have a short upfront high-level definition and planning phase. The product is then developed through a series of iterations, where iteration increments or adds to the functionality by a little. All the activities are intentionally repeated in iterations. Adaptive or agile life cycles are variants of incremental and iterative life cycles where iteration is very short, typically two to four weeks. 
Agile methodologies are becoming very popular in the software development industry and in other industries where the requirements are highly changeable and frequent feedback is beneficial. Let us now check your understanding of the topics covered in this lesson. Here is a quick recap of what was covered in this lesson. Project management is the application of knowledge, skills, and tools and techniques applied to project activities to meet the project requirements. PMO provides the policies, methodologies, and tools and templates for managing projects within the organization. Project manager has to integrate various project aspects, like the people, stakeholders, risks, communication, and procurements with the project constraints time, scope, cost, and quality. Identifying internal and external stakeholders, determining their requirements, and communicating with them regularly is an important role of a project manager. Functional, projectized, and matrix are the three types of organization structures based on the level of authority given to the project manager. Project life cycle spans the initiation of a project until the closure while product life cycle also encompasses the operational and maintenance phases. Hello and welcome to PMP certification course offered by Simply Learn. In this lesson, we will focus on project management processes. Let us begin with the objectives of this lesson. After completing this lesson, you will be able to differentiate between project life cycle and project management process. Name the five project management process groups. Describe the process group interactions. Recognize processes aligned to different process groups and knowledge areas. Identify the inputs and actions of project management process groups. Let us now begin with understanding the differences between project life cycle and project management process. Project Lifecycle addresses the question, what to do to get the work done? It varies industry-wise. For example, let us look at a typical project lifecycle in a software industry. First, you understand what is required and analyze it as part of the requirement analysis phase. Then, as part of the design phase, you figure out the implementation of it and arrive with the approach. Next, you implement the functionality by writing the code as part of the coding phase. The code is then verified to ensure it works right as part of the testing phase. The tested and verified software is then installed at the customer locations as part of the installation phase. After the installation, the system then moves into operations and support phase. The project management process addresses the question, what to do to manage the project. The processes for managing the projects are likely to be the same across industries. For instance, in the develop schedule process, one needs to develop the project schedule, irrespective of the industry or domain you are working. In the next screen, let us understand the project management process groups. The project management processes are divided into five process groups. They are initiating process group, planning process group, executing process group, monitoring and controlling process group, and closing process group. The initiating process happens at the beginning of the project or a phase. The planning, executing, and monitoring and controlling processes go together. Therefore, you plan, execute, and replan based on the execution result. The project closing processes are performed when the project work or a phase within the project is completed. The typical project management process in the closing phase releases resources back to the resource pool so the team members can be assigned to another project. Note the iteration of processes within the phases is dependent on the scale of the projects. Small projects may have only one iteration, whereas bigger projects may have multiple iterations before they enter a new phase. Project management processes are overlapping activities. Let us look at the interaction between these activities in the next screen. Process groups have overlapping activities that occur throughout the project lifecycle. 
The output of one process group is generally the input to another or a deliverable of the project. For example, Project Management Plan is an output of Planning Process Group and an input to Execution Process Group. Note that production of the plan is not a one-time activity. As the project progresses, the Project Management Plan may get updated as a result of the monitoring and controlling processes. The updated Project Management Plan once again forms an input to the Execution Process Group. In the next screen, we will discuss the Project Management Process Group, Knowledge Area, and Project Management Process Mapping. Given on the screen is the list of the 47 Project Management Processes, 10 Knowledge Areas, and 5 Process Groups. The table shows how each of them is interrelated. You can see that the Project Integration Management Processes can be mapped back to all 5 Process Groups while project scope management processes are mapped back to only planning and monitoring process group. Study the table to identify processes under project management and the knowledge area they belong to. All the 47 processes are described in detail in this tutorial. Each knowledge area is covered in detail as a lesson. It also covers how the processes map to process groups to help you understand the big picture. Further, the inputs and outputs of each of these processes, tools and techniques that are used in these processes, and what exactly happens during these processes are also discussed. In the next screen, we will cover each of the process groups. Here is a quick recap of what was covered in this lesson. Project Lifecycle addresses the question, what to do to get the work done, while Project Management Process addresses the question, what to do to manage the project. There are 47 processes in project management grouped into 10 knowledge areas and mapped to 5 process groups. Initiating process group defines a new project or phase. When the project charter is approved, the project is officially authorized. Planning process group establishes the total scope of effort, objectives, and course of action required to attain those objectives. Executing Process Group completes the work defined in the Project Management Plan to satisfy the project specifications. Monitoring and Controlling Process Group tracks, reviews, and regulates the progress and performance of the project, identifies and initiates the changes to the plan when required. Closing Process Group finalizes the activities across all project management process groups to formally complete the project phase or contractual obligations. With this, we have come to the end of this lesson. In the next lesson, we will cover Project Integration Management. Hello and welcome to PMP Certification Course offered by Simply Learn. In this lesson, we will focus on Project Integration Management. Let us begin with the objectives of this lesson. After completing this lesson, you will be able to Define Project Integration Management Identify the key role of the Project Manager, Project Team, and Project Sponsor Explain various project selection methods Describe the Project Integration Management Processes Identify key terminologies used in project integration management. In the next screen, let us take a quick look at the project management process map. There are 47 processes in project management, grouped into 10 knowledge areas, and mapped to 5 process groups. In this lesson, we will look at the first knowledge area, that is, project integration management and its processes. In the next screen, let us understand the concept of Project Integration Management. Project Integration Management involves unification, consolidation, articulation, and integrative actions that are crucial for successfully completing the project. The Project Integration Management is high-level work that Project Manager does, and it involves managing interdependencies among the other knowledge areas. The other nine knowledge areas involve detailed work in a specific direction. 
For example, project cost management deals only with how to manage cost in a project. The project management processes do not happen independently. For example, a new resource added to the project may require changes in cost or schedule or both. In dealing with such situations, the project manager integrates the processes of project management. The need for integration drives much of the communication and the work of the project manager. Let us discuss the key role of project manager, sponsor, and team in the next screen. Project manager, team members, and project sponsors have different roles to play in a project. The project manager is supposed to play multiple roles in the project. The key role is to perform integration. The project manager puts all the pieces of the project together into a cohesive whole. In doing so, the project manager tries to ensure that the project is done faster, cheaper, and utilizes resources optimally while meeting the project objectives. As the project progresses, the team members work on completing the project activities. The role of the project sponsor is to protect project from any unnecessary changes and to ensure that it has the required resources for completion. The project sponsor is the champion for the project within the performing organization, that is, the organization in which the work is being performed. In the next screen, we will cover the project selection methods. An organization can undertake a project under contract with an external organization or take up a project driven by internal business needs. There should be a formal process of selecting project in all organizations to ensure that it is making the best possible use of limited corporate resources. For example, if the organization has an option to take up any one out of the two projects, both of which use the same corporate resources, the organization would naturally select the one which is more profitable. There are two broad ways to select a project. One way is the benefit measurement method where one project is compared with other competing projects. Another approach is based on mathematical models wherein you examine the most optimal selection of projects by trying to optimize a goal. For example, maximize operating profits. Such methods may be called constrained optimization methods. There are different methods under both these categories, and you should be familiar with the names of these methods. Broadly, the benefit measurement methods focus on ascertaining the costs and benefits of undertaking the project. The methods under benefit measurement method include murder board, where a panel of experts shoots down a new project idea, peer review, scoring models, economic models, and benefit compared to cost. The constrained optimization methods rely on mathematical modeling techniques to determine the best selection of projects to achieve certain business objectives. The methods of constrained optimization method include linear programming. In reality, you might not have seen these methods to be followed in project selection. Often, personal relationship with the sponsor may be more important than anything else. This is quite normal and any organization worldwide works this way. However, as a certified project manager, it is important for you to be familiar with more scientific methods of project selection. A typical question on the PMP exam could be, what type of project selection technique is peer review? And the right answer is, benefit measurement method. You need to understand the characteristics of various project selection methods to answer scenario-based questions. In the next screen, we will focus on the project selection methods. There are six project management processes which are part of project integration management knowledge area. They are the develop project charter done in the initiation process group. Develop Project Management Plan, undertaken in the Planning Process Group. Direct and manage work carried out in the Executing Process Group. Monitor and control project and perform integrated change control, undertaken in the Monitoring and Controlling Process Group. And close project or phase done in the Closing Process Group. Let us look at each of these processes in detail. 
In the next screen, let us understand how to read process-related information. As you can see in the Project Management Process Diagram, these elements within the Knowledge Area represent the inputs from the same Knowledge Area. These elements represent the inputs from other Knowledge Areas. These represent the tools and techniques used in the process. These are outputs of the process. These represent the output within the same Knowledge Area, whereas these outputs are fed into the Knowledge Areas other than the one that the process is a part of. You can observe that the process in the image is color-coded based on the process group. Initiating process group is in yellow, planning process group is in blue, and so on. You can read the processes and their color codes in the legend box on the bottom left of the screen. The process group affiliation is also indicated in the text of the description. It is important to understand the process group context to appreciate what the process does. In the next screen, let us look at the Develop Project Charter process. Develop Project Charter is an initiating process. A project charter is essentially a document that authorizes a project. Once a project has received a charter, it means that the project manager can start employing the organization's resources for the project activities. Let us look at the key inputs to be considered in preparing the project charter. The first input is the Project Statement of Work. This is created by Project Sponsor, or the customer describing their needs, project scope, and how the project fits into their strategic goal. If the project is taken up under a contract, the Request for Proposal, that is, RFP, can be considered as Project Statement of Work. The next input is the Business Case. This document establishes whether the investment in a project is worth, from a business point of view, the business need for the project, and the cost-benefit analysis. It provides important information to the project manager about the goals of the project and the boundaries in terms of the desired results, cost, etc. If the project is being undertaken as part of a contract or agreement, the agreement provides an important input for the project manager that establishes what must be done in the project. The next input to be considered for Project Charter is Enterprise Environmental Factors. Any project to be executed within the organization has to deal with the organization culture and existing systems. You can consider this as an organization baggage that comes with the project. This is the reason a project being executed in two different organizations may be done differently. Another factor to be considered is organizational process assets. This is a broad term and includes all the organizational processes, procedures and policies, corporate knowledge base, and historical project information. Every organization develops a set of processes, procedures, and policies that are based on the best practices learned by the organization over time. The historical information includes past project management plans, risks, lessons learned, etc., of similar projects executed. Now, let us look at the tools and techniques used in this process. The first technique is expert judgment. Expert judgment is an invaluable input to the process of formally authorizing a project because an expert can provide insights into why a project makes business sense or why it does not. From experience, they may be able to shed light about the validity of the business drivers, feasibility, assumptions, and constraints that need to be considered for the project. Facilitation techniques is another technique used. The chartering process is often a collaborative activity involving many influential stakeholders in an organization. Facilitation techniques help bring all these stakeholders together and engage in fruitful discussions in order to arrive at an informed decision whether to go ahead with a project or not. The only output of this project is the project charter. Let us try to understand what the project charter might contain. The project charter usually contains the high-level project requirement and it should be created by the project sponsor and handed over to the project manager.
The project manager can do the groundwork to prepare the project charter, but it must be signed by the project sponsor or somebody in the performing organization who is higher in authority than the project manager. It is important to point out that a project charter is not a project management plan. The detailed risk, schedule, cost analysis, etc. is part of the project management plan and should be done during the project planning phase when there is more detail on the availability of the project to do so. The charter should be sufficiently high level to accommodate the minor changes that might arise in the project. In the next screen, let us discuss the second process under Project Integration Management, Develop Project Management Plan. This is the process of documenting the actions necessary to define, prepare, integrate, and coordinate the subsidiary plans. Examples of subsidiary plans are Project Time Management Plan, Project Cost Management Plan, Project Human Resource Management Plan, etc. The project management plan does not just describe when the project would start, what activities should be done, and when the project would get over. It is a detailed document and describes how the project would be executed, monitored, and controlled, and closed. Many people think that project schedule developed using Microsoft Project is the project management plan. However, that is not true. Project management plan contains all the subsidiary plans and their baseline value. It also contains the allowed variance in the baseline value. Performance measurement baseline of project's time is the total of project baseline time and the agreed time variance for the project. For example, the time management plan section would have mentioned the time taken by a project. The period mentioned in the project management plan is 180 days. This 180 day period is also called the baseline time value. Therefore, the baseline value is the initial agreed value in the project management plan. So, if the time variance agreed in the plan is 10%, the project should be executed in maximum 180 plus 180 multiplied by 10% is 180 plus 18, which is 198 days. Whether the baseline time value should be 180 days or 300 days is decided by analyzing the project activities and it should not be decided arbitrarily. In the next screen, let us look at the various inputs, outputs, and tools and techniques of this process. Let us look at the inputs considered in developing the project plan. Project charter from the previous process is an important input. The other inputs include output of the other planning processes, because the project management plan is supposed to integrate all of these plans. The examples of other plans are time management plan, cost management plan, and quality management plan, etc. All of these plans are developed over a period as the project progresses. These will be discussed in detail later in this tutorial. In addition to these, Enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets are also inputs to developing the project management plan. In fact, these two factors have more influence in developing project management plan than in developing project charter. It is recommended that you understand these inputs, outputs, and tools and techniques clearly as most of these will be repeated in other processes as well. The two tools and techniques employed in this process are expert judgment and facilitation techniques. The very obvious output of this process is the project management plan. In the next screen, let us look at some of the key terms which are crucial in understanding these processes. Let us look at a few key terms to understand project management processes. The first is the work authorization system. There should be a formal process of authorizing work within the project. So, be it internal team members or project contractor, there should be a formal process of giving go-ahead to start work on the project. The next two related terms are corrective and preventive action. You will come across these terms throughout this PMP tutorial. 
Corrective action is any action taken to bring expected future project performance in line with the project management plan. For example, if a project milestone is delayed, as a corrective action, you include additional resources to ensure that the final project deadline is not delayed. While corrective action involves implementing actions to deal with actual deviations from the performance baselines, preventive action deals with anticipated or possible deviation from performance baselines. For example, to ensure that projects are not delayed, you do a proper estimation of the work and assign enough resources to the project so that they are not delayed. A very important system that needs to be established early on in a project is the change control system. Since projects are executed in a dynamic environment, it is quite natural to expect changes in the project requirements. The change control system is the formal documented procedures paperwork tracking systems for authorizing changes. Therefore, the change control system analyzes each of the incoming change requests and decides whether to accept the change request or reject it. A configurable item is any product, service, or result within the project whose characteristics need to be identified, documented, and placed under change control mechanism. Examples of configurable items are project documents, source code, physical parts such as tools, recommended settings for machinery, etc. When a formal configuration management system is put in place, it is essentially establishing a control system that can preserve the characteristics of these items. Now, let us look at the next process of the Project Integration Management Knowledge Area, which is direct and manage project work. Direct and manage project work is the process of performing the work defined in the project management plan to achieve the project objective. This process marks the performance and completion of activities in a project. The input to this process is obviously the project management plan, since the project is executed as per the project management plan. The other inputs to this process are any approved change requests that need to be implemented. These could be in the form of corrective or preventive actions upon which the team has decided to work. The other two inputs are enterprise environmental factors and organizational process assets. Let us look at the tools and techniques. Expert judgment is an important tool used in this process as well. Another technique is the Project Management Information System or PMIS. The PMIS is a combination of documents, dashboards, software tools, etc., where the data and information related to the project gets collected as the work is being done. During execution, it is natural to expect that plenty of meetings will take place among the team members and among other stakeholders as well. There are several outputs from this process. Project deliverables are produced. As the deliverables are being produced, there would also be data related to the project performance that will be generated, such as what was done, how long did it take, how much did it actually cost, etc. Along with these key outputs, there are changes that new change requests may emerge. This could be because, during the execution phase, the team or the stakeholders may realize that what is being produced is not meeting the expectations or needs and that something else may need to be done. In the process, project documents and project management plan get updated. Let us look at monitor and control project work in the next screen. Monitor and control project work is the process of tracking, reviewing, and regulating the progress to meet the performance objective or objectives defined in the project management plan. Now, the estimated time performance measurement baseline is 180 days and 10%. The monitor and control project work is the process area that tracks whether 180 days and 10% time performance baseline is being met or not. Let us also look at the key inputs for the monitor and control project work process. Project management plan is the key input, as the performance measurement baselines are part of the project management plan. 
The other key input to monitor and control project work is work performance information. It is the status of the project, that is, the status of the project deliverables, the cost incurred, the time elapsed in the project, etc. Along with the work performance information, forecasts related to the cost and time form important inputs upon which the project manager has to act. Validated changes confirms that the approved changes have been appropriately incorporated. Enterprise environmental factors and organization process assets are also inputs to this process. Expert judgment, analytical techniques, project management information system, and meetings are the various tools and techniques. One of the outputs of this process area is change requests. Change requests could be in the nature of corrective and preventive actions or defect repair. If the performance measurement baselines are not being met, this process ensures that project manager takes appropriate corrective and preventive action to get close to the performance measurement baselines. Along with the recommended corrective and preventive action, monitor and control project work also results in identifying defects which must be taken care of. During the defect repair process, many reports related to the performance of the work of the project will be produced. Project management plan and project documents are also updated. In the next screen, let us focus on Perform Integrated Change Control Process. Perform Integrated Change Control is the process of reviewing all change requests approving and managing changes to the project deliverables, organizational process assets, project documents, and the project management plan. This is where all the recommendations for changes, corrective actions, preventive actions, and defect repairs are evaluated across all the knowledge areas and either approved or rejected. The inputs to this process are similar to that of the monitor and control project work process. Project Management Plan, Work Performance Reports, Enterprise Environmental Factors, and Organizational Process Assets. The only additional input is the Change Request, since the Perform Integrated Change Control process is supposed to take care of managing the incoming changes. To make a judgment about the Change Requests, Project Management Plan and the Work Performance Reports are also referred to. Another important tool and technique used in this, along with expert judgment and meetings, is change control tools, and most important among them is change control board. The team takes up the ownership of analyzing each of the incoming changes and also does the impact analysis for the changes, and finally approves or rejects a change. The project manager, project sponsor, and a few of the important stakeholders and team members may be part of the Change Control Board. The process should produce change requests that are approved, a log of change requests processed, requests that were either approved or rejected, and a few updates to the project plan and other documents. Change management and change control is the theme recurring in many questions in the examination. You can expect questions in the exam which test a project manager's response to a particular change in the project. In the next screen, let us take a closer look at functioning of this process. Now, let us look at the process of change. First, the project manager should determine that a change has either already occurred or if the change is necessary. One of the important qualities of a good project manager is that they will push back on unnecessary changes. The next step is to evaluate its impact on the project in totality. The team needs to understand what would be the impact on the time, cost, quality, risk, resource requirements, and so on. Once the impact is known, the project manager along with the team should look for various possible options to accommodate the change. For instance, in order to accommodate an increase in scope, it may be necessary to extend timeline, add resources, increase budget, or a combination of the above. Once the impact analysis and exploration of possible options are completed, 
the project manager should present it to internal as well as external stakeholders for their approval. It should be presented to internal stakeholders first because the management of an organization may decide to absorb the change within the project's reserves without opting to build the customer. If the project will have an impact on the agreed baselines of time, cost, scope, and quality, one needs to get in touch with the external stakeholders and the customer. These steps are an important aspect of a project manager's job and the ability of a project manager to manage change will be tested in the PMP examination. In the next screen, let us look into a business scenario to understand this concept better. After reading the problem statement, click the solution button to look at a possible answer. Close project or phase is the last process of the project management integration knowledge area. This process ensures that the project or a phase is formally closed after completion. Remember that PMI expects a mature organization and a trained project manager to be diligent in following closure formalities. Without going through the formal closure formalities, the project cannot abruptly be closed. The project should be formally closed, even if it is terminated due to some problem. The key input to this process is the accepted deliverables. The deliverables have to be brought into a state that they can be properly transitioned. Transition means they are handed over to the organization or group that will be responsible for operations, maintenance, and support. The other inputs are project management plan and organizational process assets. Expert judgment, analytical techniques, and meetings are the commonly used tools and techniques. The closure of a project or phase results in a product, service, or a transition. In the process, one of the important outputs is updates to the organizational process assets. These include the actual performance against the plan, the key lessons learned during the project, the risks identified, the updates to the skills and experience of the team members, etc. Updating these assets is mandatory as it helps the organization gain maturity and learn from the experience. In the next screen, let us look into a business scenario to understand this concept better. After reading the problem statement, click the solution button to look at a possible answer. Here is a quick recap of what was covered in this lesson. Project integration management involves unification, consolidation, articulation, and integrative actions that are crucial for successfully completing the project. Integrating the project activities is the key role of a project manager. The project team focuses on completing the project activities and the project sponsor warrants the team against unsolicited changes. Benefit measurement methods ascertain the costs and benefits of undertaking the project, while constrained optimism methods rely on mathematical modeling to select the best projects that achieve business objectives. Various project integration management processes are Develop Project Charter, Develop Project Management Plan, Direct and Manage Work, Monitor and Control Project, perform integrated change control, and close project or phase. With this, we have come to the end of this lesson. In the next lesson, we will cover project scope management.